Folks, welcome to Cooking Together. Um, really thankful to be here with multi-time James Beard Award nominee, Chef Cindy Wolf. Thanks for letting me and us invade your kitchen on this lovely Sunday afternoon. Um, again, we want to thank you all for being here and welcome. This is a world's greatest meal event where we're raising money to end polio for the Rotary Foundation. Uh, throughout the evening, you will see a link in the chat box uh, to go and donate. If you'd like to continue to donate funds to this cause, please do so in uh, via the link in the chat box. Um, and again, thanks for uh, anybody who's here this evening and your donation that you made will go to in polio now. And we appreciate you, uh, you donating to be here. And next up, I'm going to toss it over to our, our beloved district governor, Miss Nancy Whitlock. Nancy, take it away. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Uh, welcome and thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. I'm District Governor Nancy Whitlock and it is really a pleasure to have you with us at our first virtual foundation celebration. Uh, we're also pleased to have with us this evening RI Director Peter Kyle, uh, Zone 33 Regional Rotary Foundation Coordinator Nancy Barbie, and Zone 33 Major Gifts Officer for the Rotary Foundation, Laurie Menzel. Our team has planned a truly unique and entertaining virtual production entitled Cooking Together, showcasing, as you just met, award-winning chef Cindy Wolf, who will get a lengthier introduction momentarily. I hope you all had a chance to visit our website, which was designed specifically for this event, 7570givesback.com, featuring our chefs, the menu, including drink pairings, our 7570 donors who generously support our foundation. As you know, November is Foundation Month, and this event provides us with the opportunity to celebrate the Rotary Foundation our foundation, which makes doing good in the world possible. I'm a strong supporter of the Rotary Foundation, and I'm very pleased that this evening's event supports something that I feel passionate about, polio eradication. Polio continues to be the number one priority of the Rotary Foundation, and Rotary is going to keep its promise to the world to end polio, but we need your continued support to achieve that goal. 100% of the proceeds from Cooking Together Foundation Celebration event will be donated to the Rotary Foundation's Polio Plus Fund. We are so pleased to have Rotary International Director, Dr. Stephanie Yurchik with us this evening. I hope you had an opportunity to read her bio that was included in the email with your Zoom link. And now it is my honor to introduce our I Director for Zones 33 and 34 and past Board of Trustees of the Rotary Foundation, Dr. Stephanie Yurchik. Take it away, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Nancy. I'm so delighted to be with you tonight because this is another example of how Rotarians in our zones have become so creative. You know, the way that we met in Rotary was ripped from us about eight months ago. And the way that we did fundraising was ripped from us. But I, I, I send congratulations to you for quickly figuring out I loved your slides that said Rotary isn't canceled because that's absolutely true. The world needs Rotary now more than ever. As Nancy mentioned, I've had the great pleasure of being both now a director, but also I've uh, been a board of trustee member. So I've had an opportunity to see both sides of our organization. As you know, Rotary International is the part of Rotary that lets us do the administrative work and support clubs but our Rotary Foundation is the arm of Rotary that allows us to do the magic around the world. What impresses me so much about District 7570 
is how seriously you take the Rotary Foundation. I looked at um, so much information about your district and besides being generous givers, the fact that you have foundation advocates in all 15 of your areas and that you have all subcommittees of the Rotary Foundation operational means that you have at least 25 people in your district who are educating Rotarians and inspiring Rotarians. And don't think for a minute that every district does that. So bravo to you for doing that. I also note when information comes through, uh, significant gifts that come from your district. And I'm so happy now tonight, um, I believe they're on the call. I just wanted to um, uh, say congratulations to the Quillens. And I think it's pronounced Blido, is that correct, Tracy? So correct me if I'm not saying it correctly. But both of these couples have recently decided to become Bequest Society members, meaning that they're thinking ahead and they're thinking about the power of the Rotary Foundation and the good that it does in the world. So from all of the trustees, as well as all the directors, we thank you so much for that commitment that you've made. I am so anxious to see what Chef Cindy has cooking up for us tonight. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great honor to be part of your celebration tonight and I'm so looking forward to it. I just wish somebody would come to my kitchen and cook it for me. So thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We, we are so happy you're with us here tonight. And wait, Will should be doing the intro. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back, folks. Oh, wait, oh. Will's doing it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Napier. I'm a Paul Harris Fellow and the son of past District Governor Ron Napier and current Administrative Assistant Governor Kathy Napier. Uh, I was also a two time Rotary Youth Exchange student. I spent the summer of 2003 in uh, District 1650 in Brittany, France, and most of a year between 2005 and 06 in District 3340 in Udantani, Thailand. Uh, and for the past 10 years, I've had the absolute pleasure to work for Chef Cindy Wolf, a nine-time James Beard Award finalist for Best Chef in the Mid-Atlantic. Chef Wolf consistently plays at the top of her game. She and her business partner, Tony Foreman, have led the restaurant renaissance in Baltimore and have really helped put the city on the country's culinary map. Chef Wolf has never been a stranger to honest cooking or hard work. At the age of 19, with no prior kitchen experience, she began an apprenticeship at Silk's, then Charleston, South Carolina's premier restaurant at the legendary Planters Inn. After graduating from the Culinary Institute of America at Hyde Park, New York, Chef Wolf worked at some of the finest restaurants in the South and the nation's capital and rose to the rank of executive chef by age 25. She started what has consistently been ranked one of the top restaurants in the region, Charleston where she has been co-owner and executive chef for over 22 years. The restaurant is like a second home to Chef Wolf, and you will find her on the line in the kitchen that she designed most every night of the week. She and Tony Foreman now co-own five other restaurants in Baltimore, the latest named in her honor, opened just last month. Her cooking, as you will see tonight, is rooted in both French fundamentals and authentic Southern food ways. Her deep knowledge of food product, extensive experience, and commitment to excellence has made her one of the leading chefs in the country. It is now my great honor to introduce your host for the evening, Chef Cindy Wolf. Yay, Will! Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you for that kind, warm introduction, Will. Here she is. I love you, Will. Thank you for that. I miss you. All right, so I'm so excited and I'm so ready to cook and we have to get our grits going. So before I like do anything else, I'm turning on my pot for my grits and uh, the milk needs to come up to just under a boil uh, or under a simmer. And uh, so I've got four cups of milk in my pot and I have my cup of grits ready to go. I'm going to put a little bit of salt in the milk right now. And if you don't like salt or can't have salt, just don't put it in there. But if you can, uh, you want 
you want salt in there. It's very important. Uh, it's come up. It just started to simmer if you saw it. And I have to, in the beginning, you whisk in your grits. So um, we whisk in the grits uh, because right now they're loose, right? And uh, they are going to thicken up and become like that. So if you can see that, Andy, um, like any starch, those are the, you know, pro properly, oops, properly prepared grits. Yeah. Um, so it's funny. It's kind of fun to see them like this. And it really does tell you uh, that you're working with something that is uh, not processed in any way because yeah. for it to take so long for them to cook. So in the beginning, now you should be at this point now on low heat. So knock it down to low. Uh, one of the things you do not want to have happen is for this to scorch do not let this scorch um you will or and certainly don't let it start to brown or burn um that you will ruin them so this is a long slow long and slow process um so i have a little bit of but i'm gonna put a tiny bit more butter in and so that was just like you know a couple of ounces of butter uh and i want to taste it because one of the things about uh cooking a starch you have to recognize that the starch is absorbing a liquid and if that liquid doesn't taste good from the very beginning, it needs a little more salt. If it doesn't taste good from the very beginning, it's not going to taste good at the end. Um, so I just add a little bit of salt. So make sure you're still stirring because you're going to stir this pot until I'm going to turn this down to the absolute lowest setting on my stove because even on my turn down low, that's not low enough. It's going too fast. So keep an eye on it. It should barely be barely be cooking all right anything about those grits are they as far as where they came from yes so these are beautiful uh grits that i've been working with for my entire career uh pretty much since i've been an executive chef since i was 25 years old they are stone ground by by anson's mill in charleston south carolina and actually they're technically uh located in columbia uh, south carolina and ironically andy um the man that runs this mill was a general manager of the restaurant where I did my apprenticeship in Charleston when I was 19 years old. So the man that was the GM of the restaurant where I first started really working professionally um, eventually got out of the restaurant business. Obviously, he's older than me, but he eventually got out of the restaurant. So you can see them starting to thicken up. Um, so it's important to recognize that they are getting nice and thick, which is great. Uh, I want to taste them one more time just to make sure I have a good amount of salt in here. Mm, perfect. And the butter is perfect. Everything is good. Excuse me. Everything is good. And the, and oh my gosh, they're starting to get really pretty. So yours should be thickening up now too. If, 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 if I've scared you so much that you've turned it down so low that they're not thick at this point, um, you may want to turn your heat up just a tiny, tiny bit. But again, stay in the corners of the pot, stay on the bottom of the pot. All right, getting back to uh, Anson Mill. So when Glenn Roberts, who is the owner of Anson's Mill, um, when he decided to leave the restaurant business and uh, dedicate himself to the pathways of Southern cooking. He is an amazing man. He is absolutely brilliant. Um, I would totally follow him on any sort of uh, on the website about him because he has preserved so many different things for us to use now. We use petite rouge peas at Charleston. We use um, Sea Island white rice peas at Charleston. And these were things that until a few years ago, weren't even available anymore. And they are the old type of beans that were grown in South Carolina uh, prior to the Civil War. And these seeds, uh, a lot of the way they, they can bring these products back, kind of like how they brought back Carolina gold rice, is that Clemson University is a seed bank and a lot of the seeds for these products were found there. So, oh my gosh, these are starting to look really good. All right, so I'm happy with this. We need to start our soup. So now I'm in this nice, beautiful copper pot. And I do, I do want to talk about pots in a moment, but we need to get our soup going uh, because it will take a little while, just like the grits, and we don't want to end up behind. So I'm putting butter in the pot. I'm on high heat. All right. So uh, in the recipe, I told you you needed to have a heavy bottom pot for every single thing that we're doing. Um, but we will get back to pots in a moment. I don't think you're going to switch out your pot right now. So whatever you've got, that's what we're going to use. So... Um, we have the butter melting beautifully in the bottom of this pot. I'm going to move the grits over just for a moment. Um, Tara, can you see well in there? All right, cool. So I want you to be able to see this process. It's extremely important. So I'm going to move my grits over 
uh, onto this burner, which is actually, my stove is super cool. I have an extremely high uh, British thermal unit BTU burner in the center. I can boil water in no time. Um, this is a very slow burner. Uh, typically on these stoves, the smaller the cap on the burner, the lower the BTUs. Uh, so um, this is gonna, these grits are gonna cook gently over here on this low heat burner. My butter has completely melted in here. It's actually starting to brown. I'm gonna add my leeks, which we, you already chopped. Um, <clears throat> you should have all your mise en place ready to go. So the leeks are going to work. And this is, um, I actually added a little bit of shallot. So, so what you wanna think about is the next time you make this soup or if you modify this soup, know that you can, I wasn't sure if everybody would be able to get shallots and that's why I did not include them in the recipe. But shallots are beautiful. Oh my gosh, this smells so good. And look how beautifully that's cooking. I'm gonna add a tiny bit more butter. Okay, so I'm gonna have a little bit more butter in my pot. Uh, my grits are, I'm not going to stop paying attention to my grits. Honestly, the more you stir your grits, the better they're going to be. It's a little bit like making risotto. Um, when you work the starch, you it becomes more tender and it just has a, it has a much better texture. That's what it ends up being. And everything like with risotto, which is a totally different process made with rice, um, the more you stir it, the more it becomes rich and creamy seeming. It All does right. smell amazing in here. Oh right my gosh, now, so. I know, leeks, oh, shallots, shallots are just so gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, so uh, like I said, next time you make the soup, but the leeks smell so good, don't they? Yeah, this and, it smells um, amazing. The leeks smell good and the shallot and that's Vidalia onion in there. So it's all good and I want no color here. So I'm just going to cook this. I'm just going to cook this long enough to make everything tender. Okay. Um, so no color because this is a, this basically it's a, it's a white soup. So if, if uh, we don't want brown in the soup, we want it to be white. You're working with cauliflower so and potatoes. So now we're coming over our leeks and our onions. And since I added shallots are perfect, I'm going to add the cauliflower. So you have, this one's a little big. I'm gonna actually pull this one apart. Um, this one's also a little big. I actually just cut the florets off the stem Okay. Yeah, and so they're they're all uniform. You want things to always be uniform in size. That's why my potatoes are are uniform in size. Um, why because is that? you want everything to cook at the same time. Cool. You don't want some of the potatoes to be soft before the other potatoes. Okay. So as I work, I'm getting rid of my dirty things and getting them out of my work area. That's just a smart and organized way to work. So we now have cauliflower. You've just added your cauliflower, please, and you've added your potatoes. All right. So cauliflower, potatoes, and your onion and your leek are in here. Did you no. say anything about the pot? Uh, not yet. All right, so now we can talk about it because we're actually going on this. All right, so this, <laughs> is, a, <laughs> this is a copper pot. And it's a beautiful copper pot. It right? is. It is oh gorgeous, my gosh, yes. I love this pot. Actually, I've never used this one. I have a whole set of copper um, that I really try to keep aside, but I also have some pieces that I bought in Europe and I've had for 20, 30 years, well, 30, hmm, 30 years. <laughs> Andy. I didn't do that. Oh my gosh, you did. I admitted that. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is, this is copper, which is an excellent conductor of heat. Yeah. So what you want is, I mean, it's the best pot you can buy. Obviously they're ungodly expensive. Um, if you can afford one, buy one because it will last forever if you take care of it and you can pass it down to other generations of your family. It will literally last forever if you take care of it. Excellent. And can you tell that this is stainless steel lined? So yeah. typically the old pans were lined with tin and you can still buy copper pans lined with tin. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer stainless steel because it, it is, I don't have to ever have this retinned. You know, I don't like the idea of working with tin and like, 15 years after I bought it, all of a sudden I have to find somebody that will retin it for me. There are not that many people in this world that can do that anymore. Sure. All right, so what we need to do, actually, would you hand me the cream, Andy? Absolutely. Thank you, you're awesome. Um, so I'm going to add uh, cream to this because everything is in good shape. So you didn't actually really cook your cauliflower or your potatoes too much. You just sort of let them sweat with the onion and the uh, shallot for a little bit. Um, now we need to season it. So. I just basically wanted to cover my cauliflower and all my, my ingredients with the cream. 
I'm going to add, I just added salt. And again, add salt to your taste. If you over salt it, you can't do a thing about it. It's better to, if you have to add a little salt later. I love black pepper. Um, black pepper does better. Uh, you, you can season in the beginning, but it's also good to season at the end because when it's freshly added at the end, it has more impact. All right. And then the other two spices and be careful with your nutmeg. I, when I say a pinch, I literally mean a pinch. Like, like, like. Yeah, show the camera over there. Right, right. So it's literally like. Oh, back up a little Actually, bit. Actually, that might even be too much. I'm going to do half of that. No, I'm going to do it all. Okay, so just a. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Just a little bit of that nutmeg, which is freshly ground. I mean, uh, well, it is freshly ground. I freshly ground it. But if you buy processed, you might want, and this is cayenne pepper that I'm about to put in, and that is up to your taste. Don't make the soup spicy because it'll ruin the soup. But if you like cayenne, you can maybe put a little bit more in uh, than someone else that doesn't like heat at all, or perhaps you have a dietary restriction and you can't you can't have cayenne. So now our soup is working. We're we're in good shape right now. All right. So this is on high. So you you and anytime you're anytime you're on high. <laughs> so would you taste it at this point? No, I'm sorry. No, okay. I need it to come up to a boil. I've seasoned it well, and also I also know what I'm doing, so that's a difference. Okay. But I would like it to come up to a boil because the flavors will come together. The flavors will come together better if if it comes up to a boil, and then I will taste it absolutely because it's got to be right as it cooks. And this is a relatively fast process because the, all we're doing is making sure the potatoes are cooked and that the um, cauliflower is soft. We want everything to be soft. And then once it's soft, you are done. You can puree and strain. So um, literally you can make this soup in, you know, 20, 25 minutes, okay. which is nice. Yeah. You know, it's quick. So I'm on high heat. I'm Good midweek dinner, right? Right. Oh my gosh. Well, the other thing too is with this soup, if you're just like, you want a rustic Sunday dinner or, or midweek dinner, um, you could slice the cauliflower. You could make sure everything is in a small dice otherwise. Uh, or Brunois for the shallots. And by the way, the shallot is the smallest of all dice. So it, like, it's literally like tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, you could slice a cauliflower and just cook it and not puree it. And that way you don't have to get out your blender. You don't have to deal with the blender and your family just enjoy it because cauliflower is so good and the potatoes are so good, but make sure everything's the same size because obviously you wouldn't want your cauliflower to cook before your potatoes, but that's a fun way to do it. Yeah, you know, that's cool. this is more refined. Sure. And, um, you know, if you're having guests over, I would, I would puree the soup. The other great thing about this soup is that you do not have to pass it through a strainer. So, um, I, almost every single soup I make, I pass through a chinois, which is, uh, the finest of all. It's a conical sieve. I don't have one here, but we use them at the restaurant all the time. It's a conical sieve. It has a very, very fine, uh, mesh sieve in it. So it literally gets everything, but yet will allow product to pass through. You just have to, we use a two ounce ladle. It's the perfect thing. A two ounce ladle is about the bottom of the ladle is about that big mm -hmm. and it fits right in the bottom of the chinois. It's perfect. So it literally passes everything, almost everything through. Um, and that just makes it, takes it one step further and makes it finer. But with the soup, you don't have to, which is cool. really great. I like not, you know, it's nice for you at home to not have to do the soup, uh, that step. So this, I'm waiting for this to come up to a boil, which is going to be pretty quick. So hopefully you're on the same track as me. Um, if you're on the same track as me, uh, if you're about to come to a boil, you want to turn it down on low again and let that go. And you know, all this time I've been talking, guess what I haven't been doing? I have not been stirring my grits. I should make you in charge. You of the should make, I mean, I would love to be, <laughs> okay. have the honor of being your sushi. All chef. right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so if you, if you are, you know, you, you have some people in your family helping you or your couple or whatever, um, you know, somebody should pay attention to the grits while the other person's busy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. So you're my couple. Okay. And, uh, you, if you see me not doing it, you can. All Perfect. right. So I'm starting to come up to a boil. You see? So it's starting to simmer on the edges. Yep. And one thing I'm a little bit concerned about here is that you see how my cream doesn't quite cover the top of the mm -hmm. product. I'm yep. going to add, I'm going to add a little, I'm going to add a little water to this. Okay. So if you find yourself in the same situation for whatever reason, um, I mean, you've got potatoes in there. They're going to thicken the soup very quickly. It will not hurt to put a little water. Or if you uh, eat chicken stock, you can add a little chicken stock at this point. All right. All right, so now we're covered. I'm gonna turn it back up, to, or it is still up. Um, I want it to come back up to a boil and then I'll taste it. So are you looking for like a rolling heavy boil or just like a just little kind of bubbling yeah, around the edge? Bubbling, you're right, yes. Uh, simmering around the edges. I don't want it to boil because again, it's a delicate process and I don't want anything to scorch or burn. So yes, all right, so let's let it come back up to a simmer. 
Um, pay attention to your uh, grits. I got to talk. I got too busy work, worrying about your, <laughs> your soup over there. All right. All right. So we have our grits going. All right. So let's talk about the other pans that we have here. So I just used this. This is a Heston pan. And it is one of the best pans I've ever worked with. It's a relatively new product. I, I, I think I started buying them about a year or two ago. And you can see it's called, I think it's called Nanobond. Yeah, Nanobond technology. I love that. It sounds so futuristic. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so it's a beautiful pan and they have a cleaning product um, that will, you, you never want to use metal on a pan like this. Okay. So you, if you were to use an SOS, like my mother would have on a pan, <laughs> it will scratch the surface okay. and ruin. I mean, right now it's like silk on the bottom. It's a beautiful surface and it's extremely easy to clean, um, quite frankly, unless you burn the pan. Um, <clears throat> so if you soak the pan, uh, like I get really, if I, if I, let's say I make bacon, which tends to always make your pan kind of brown on the bottom. Um, if I soak it in really hot water with a little bit of dish detergent, um, I should be able to use a green pad and like, that's the end of the story. It literally will just lift. I might even be able to use the sponge side, nice. which is great. Um, this is a great conductor of heat. This is just a super, it's heavy. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's... Yeah. It's a, it's, and it's the wow. same. <laughs> I know. Right. Right. And that's, that's another cool. thing. That's what I, what, that's what I mean when I say a heavy bottom pan, yeah. like, um, and I don't like cooking in aluminum. Like we have no aluminum pans left at Charleston. So, um, except for our stock pots, which we've had since we opened 23 years ago. And that's okay because mm -hmm. there's no acid in stock. So, but acid reacts with aluminum and we do not want that, that to happen, particularly because like in this instance, we're making the cauliflower soup and we're making grits, which are both white products. Right. And if it reacts, it's going to turn gray. I mean, it may be really subtle and maybe you wouldn't notice it, but I would, mm -hmm. and it will also sure. react with the product. So uh, aluminum obviously reacts with acid. And like, if you had an aluminum pan that was straight aluminum and you poured lemon juice on there, you would see the reaction. So um, it's fine if a pan has aluminum in it, but it needs to be core. All right. Keep wanting to touch your- Yeah, you do that. I'm touching the grits. <laughs> I'm touching the grits. <laughs> you do that and I will get- All right. So would you say the, the, the a pan is a good investment for like a home cook? Absolutely. That's like, you know, over, over a knife or anything, you would say that's the- Not over a knife. Okay. I, I would say they're equally important. I, I can't say over a knife. Um, but maybe if you don't have the skills that you really need for good knife work, you know, maybe, okay, a pan is more important. <laughs> I'll go with you. It's okay. very hard for me to say that because I am a chef and my knives are so, all of our, our knives are so important to us. Okay. This soup is going, but I, I want it to go a little bit faster. So I'm not going to be on low heat for right now. I need it to simmer a little bit more than it is. It's going to take too long. Well, the grits are coming along beautifully. Yes. Picking up nicely. Good. All right. And did you get in the corners? You have I to get, yeah, now. see all that stuff here, here. Um, so you have a towel Thank and you. now I have a towel. Uh, by the way, I already have my blender out. It's on the corner on the countertop. So you want to get we call it mise en place. Mise en place means everything in its place. Uh, it's French terminology. So all the mise en place that I had, the onions, the leeks, uh, the cauliflower, everything that I had to make my soup, I had it all prepared, and then I make the soup. And um, so part of that mise en place is your equipment as well. So back to pots and pans because they are so unbelievably important. Um, so I have two copper pots on the stove. I have two of the um, Heston Nano Bond pans. And this is an all clad, which has always been my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and this is copper core. So you can see that all clad has a bunch of different lines. So, um, you know, the copper, one of their lines is kind of thin and I would not get that, which is obviously the least expensive of their line. Um, I would invest, if I'm gonna do it, I would invest and go ahead and get the, the heavier quality pan, better quality, heavier metal pan. Um, with, a, with a copper core, there's a, a line right here of mm -hmm. copper. Uh, so you know it's that pan, it's super heavy duty. It is, it's super heavy duty, it is, Oh, it's just so perfect to cook in. We That's do have a question, Chef, um, okay. from Mary Pettit. What is the brand of the pan you were talking about earlier? Heston. Think, can you spell it? Yes. Let me look. It. Right. Spell it. <laughs> sure it. See, yeah, I told you I have bad jokes. It's H E S T A N. Heston. Heston. Okay. So um, Heston, and it's the Nano Bond. I don't know if they have other. I think this is the only one they have, but it's Nano Bond technology. They're made in Italy. I didn't realize that. 
<laughs> we learned something new. Yay. Everybody's learning today. We're learning. All right. Soup is doing super well. I hope yours is. Does anybody have any questions? Because I am here to answer all of your questions. I'm going to slide over here and see if there are any questions. All right. I really want to taste the soup again. So I'm getting my spoon out. And I want to taste it again because it's not that far off. I want to make sure we're good. This is a good opportunity for folks to take photos. We encourage you to take photos of your cooking experience, throw them on social media, and uh, hashtag, what is it, cooking together. Throw the hashtag in the uh, chat box for me. Leadership crew, we've got a, a good team on here who are working the, the Zoom call for us on the back end, so I want to thank them for that. But yeah, take photos, post on your favorite Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, maybe even do a TikTok video and hashtag cooking together. Okay. I just added a little bit more cayenne and nutmeg. I think I was trying to be careful for you all. Uh, it needs a little bit more. And um, also, uh, I added a little bit more salt to mine. So make sure you taste it because we're getting close. As long as you cut your cauliflower small enough, we're getting close to this soup being done, which is awesome. Um, I want to tell you uh, something extremely important about pureeing this soup. Putting a hot soup in a blender is one of the more dangerous things you can do in a kitchen, okay? So do not overload the blender. Uh, just, just so I don't have to worry about you when I go to sleep tonight, um, don't fill your blender more than 50%. Um, I will admit that at the restaurant we do 80%, but I, I, we're professionals. We do it all the time. We also have hot lids on our blender. Uh, I have one of the best blenders in the world. It's called a Vita Prep, and I know some of the stores have those. I don't know... I think it's a little, the Vita preps in the stores are a little different from our commercial ones. Um, but uh, the Vita prep is nice because it's got the hot lid, which allows the steam to escape, which means the lid won't blow off in your face. And that's the other thing you need to think about. That blender is right, I mean, I'm 5'4", so I'm short, but it's pretty close to my face. I certainly don't want to burn my face. I don't want you to burn anything. So just be careful. Um, and so don't overload the blender and you start on low. We Always start on low. We've got a question for your chef from Amy Shuttle. She wants to know if you could use an immersion blender instead. Yes, you can. It will not get it as fine. That's the only difference. An immersion blender, uh, that's one of the reasons why we like the Vita Prep so much because the Vita Prep is like, it's called a power tool. <laughs> uh, that's how they marketed it when they first came out with them. And it, it's fair because it is like a power tool. That will puree anything into oblivion, which is great. Like asparagus is super. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, fibrous? fibrous, thank you. Uh, asparagus is super fibrous. Like if I make asparagus soup in a Vita prep, I can almost get it all to puree. And whatever doesn't puree, you don't want anyway, so you just strain it out. But um, yeah, so an immersion blender is perfectly fine. You just won't get quite the fine texture. Okay. So one of the cool things about the soup, when you do do it in a blender, it almost has a mousse-like texture. Uh, so I kind of want you to so use. It whips some I air, want you to use a blender. <laughs> Pardon okay. me. It whips some air in there as of well. Of course, maybe? of yeah. course, it does. Which that would dissipate anyway. But it, it just, I think it's just the action of perfect pureeing. All right, so we are going to need to make some shrimp, uh, shrimp here. So. Um, I would definitely have I would definitely have someone uh, probably with me at this point, or I would make the soup ahead of time. If I was working by myself, I would have already made the soup. Um, the shrimp should uh, be done at the last moment, right before plate up. The grits you could have made earlier too. Obviously, I'm teaching you how to make things, um, so we're making it together. But typically, my grits would have been made, my soup would have been made, and all I would have to do is heat up my grits and heat up my soup. Question, Chef. Yes. From our friend. Liz Pobar, she wants to know what happened, what to do if she put too much salt in the grits. That, I, that's why I was saying don't over salt things because uh, if you over salt, there's, I can't change that. If you under salt, you can add more salt later. So there is no solution to that. Do not over salt things. No. You can't just drop Sorry. a potato in there. That's an old wives tale. That, I mean, you could just because it adds volume. I mean, it adds volume. Any In any way that you add volume uh, will reduce the salt. So mm -hmm. you could add more of everything, frankly. You could just make a bigger bigger batch of soup, uh, but the problem is is that things are gonna cook at different, they're gonna cook at different times. Oh, gotcha. So you could add a little bit more cream or a little bit of unsalted chicken stock. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you could add another, you could cook a potato on the side and a little bit of cream and chicken stock with no salt and add that. 
that's what you'd have to do. You'd okay. have to cook it separately. Okay. And you could do that. Cool. Thank you, you can save it. I guess what I mean is right now you can't save it. <laughs> for tonight, right now, for dinner, you can't save it. <laughs> but you could fix it for the... Sorry, time. Liz. Yeah. Your grits might be a little salty this evening. Okay. I'm curious. Are everybody's Is everybody's potato and cauliflower getting soft? Okay. Are yours? Yes. <laughs> are you challenging me, Andy? <laughs> I'm just asking questions, Chef. <laughs> All right. So I have prepared grits on the back of the stove that are ready to go. And I also have cauliflower soup here that is ready to go. I'm going to start heating both of those up. As you're doing that, i got another question. They want to know how you reheat. Uh, what? Uh, reheat that's what? a good question. It's oh. pretty vague. <laughs> okay. So uh, the it just soup? says how you reheat. Okay. On, on, on this, okay, I don't have a microwave. I'll tell you that right now. Um, I don't believe in them. I, 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 I am a two-time cancer survivor and I already have enough uh, concerns about the world. I'm not gonna have a microwave in my house. Even before I was sick, I wouldn't have a microwave in my house. So I would prefer that you heat it up on the stove gently on low heat. So again, if you're in a heavy bottom pan, it's going to, it's going to heat up beautifully. Either the, the cauliflower soup or the grits will heat up gently. Heat them up gently, stay on the bottom, take care of it, and they will all be good. Uh, you can't reheat the shrimp grit. The shrimp grit is a, is a very volatile. The reason we, I want to show you how to do this is because we're making a butter sauce in the pan that will break at any moment. Mm -hmm. So we need to make it and serve it. Okay. So you need to puree your soup. Everybody hopefully is ready to puree. Um, I'm not going to puree mine. Um, I'm gonna to start to do the shrimp grit. Okay. So, so, so puree your soup into oblivion so it's nice and smooth, right? You've got your grits ready to go basically. Keep letting them cook on low heat. And while that's happening, how much time do we have? So oh, we're good. We got okay. 15, we have like, 20 minutes. Okay, okay. All right, so they're not ready to eat. No. Do we have 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay, so. let's talk yeah. about a little, a few other things then. All right. Okay. Well, I got a question for you if you want to do that real yeah, quick. Yeah, definitely. What is substitute for heavy cream? <laughs> for heavy cream. Watch out for my camera over there. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you know, you know, when you cook at home, it's just not the same as at the restaurant. Yeah, no. that's fair. But I do that's need to fair. clean this up because that's not okay. All right. A substitute for heavy cream. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> heavy cream for the soup, you could use half and half, but I wouldn't suggest it. There are often times when I really don't think there is a substitute. Um, and that's because I want things to be the best they can be. So um, I wouldn't put cream in there if I didn't think that was the right way to make the soup. Okay. Um, but if you, if you really have a problem with the cream, maybe do less cream and more chicken stock, or I've never tried to make it with half and half. I'm, I'm just concerned that half and half will break. break up. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's your answer is that you, you go ahead and just do more chicken stock and less cream and have a slightly different texture on your soup. Okay. So this is still working. All right, I'm going to turn this off, and then we're going to talk about a couple of things then since okay. we have a little bit of time. Yeah. So the I, I just want to show you these beautiful grits, right? So you can put your hand in there. Sweet. Run your hand through it. So these are coarsely ground. Wow, they really are. Oh, my gosh. And they are, they are stone ground from an heirloom variety corn that was grown in the South, again, prior to the Civil War. So uh, when I first started buying grits from Glenn, he didn't have this corn to grind. He was still, you know, they were still using the type of corn that was being grown in the South at that time, which was probably, you know, a commercial crop and et cetera. But as he, you know, learned more, became more involved in preserving these pathways of Southern cooking and finding these old seeds and having farmers grow them, um, this developed. So I mean, I just, I just love these grits. So they are ground. Okay. Oh my gosh. There's a place in, <laughs> <Love> <laughs> there's a place in Charleston called Middleton plantation. And if you ever go to Charleston, South Carolina, you should go to One Middleton. One of my favorite cities. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I lived there at the beginning of my career and, um, my parents moved from northern Indiana when I was, when I was in my senior year of high school, uh, my first year of college, actually, uh, to Charleston, South Carolina. My father uh, was one of the first people to import lamb uh, into the United States from New Zealand. Okay. Uh, my dad was always in the food business. Uh, my great-grandfather and my grandfather were butchers in York, Pennsylvania, which is just about an hour away from here. And uh, my father grew up where the butcher shop was out back of their house. And my father was born in 1926. So 
he was growing up, he was a little guy during the Great Depression. And um, my dad, from the time he was old enough to stand on a stool, uh, was stirring the scrapple in the butcher shop. So my dad was a master butcher by the time he was, and a real master butcher, uh, by the time he was 17 years old, wow. right before he went off to World War II. Uh, he was he was stationed in Guam during World War II. So um, food is in my blood. I love food. I mean, my mother's a great cook. My grandmother's, all the ladies in my family are great cooks. Um, and uh, see, that's what happens when you talk. I know. That was my <laughs> fault. That's my job. No, it's not your fault. It's my no, job. No, no, no. Uh, it always lies with the chef. You're just helping me. <laughs> um, but yeah, keep an eye on things. And um, But the kitchen, isn't the kitchen one of the best places to talk? Yes, Andy. for sure. I, I mean, mean, I, I love right? to cook. It is, you know, I, I like to say it's my love language. You know, if I yep. if I can cook for people, then it, it really makes me happy. And uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's one of my favorite I agree. Things to do. That's how I feel. Um, during COVID, it just broke my heart to go into the restaurant and, yeah. you know, not have anyone there. It was just, it's it's just too foreign to me. Um, but back to uh, so my little family history. Um, uh, so I grew up with good food and because my father did well at when I, I'm the youngest child in my family, um, at the end of his career, we got to eat in a lot of really great restaurants. And, um, I just, you know, I was eating sweetbreads and hearts of palm and, and smoked salmon when I was 10 years old. Wow. So, um, I'm very thankful for that because I don't know too many cooks that have had that kind of opportunity mm -hmm. growing up. Um, you know, we, we tend to be, uh, people that haven't had a lot of opportunity, uh, in kitchens and, um, so that, I'm very thankful for that. And um, so, yeah, my father uh, was a, a is my ment was my mentor. He's passed away. Um, and, but I adored him. And 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 uh, I'm so thankful for my family background uh, or I wouldn't be who I am and what I do. And, and my life is cooking. I love what I do. So finding the best ingredients is my job as a chef, as well as taking care of my staff and teaching them everything I can and giving them the most positive work environment they can possibly be in. Um, here are the leeks. Um, and I just wanted to show, show them to you. I mean, you already have them and have already worked with them. But one of the things about leeks, if you can get them where the top is really green and in really good condition, and these did not have that, um, you can chop that and add it to the soup at the end, which gives you a whole bunch of vitamins. And uh, the, uh, leeks are high in niacin, so they're really quite good for you. Cool. So uh, I would just wanted to point out if you did have some nice green tops, you could, if you still have them, wash them and pop them a, a few into the into the soup. The other thing I have here are flowers from my garden, um, and I use these as garnish uh, for Charleston. And these are marigolds, so they are edible okay. and they make a beautiful garnish. And then this is the tasso ham, and just quickly, tasso ham is a Cajun cured. Uh, ham. That's beautiful. Oh my gosh. I, I just love this product and all the wonderful spices on the outside and the way they cure it. Um, but it has cayenne pepper, paprika, uh, dried thyme, um, uh, garlic powder. So a lot of spice on the outside, which helps to flavor your dish. So talk about salt. We do not salt the shrimp grit. All right, you're gonna tell me when I have five minutes before I'm when I'm cooking my shrimps. That's okay. your job. That because, works. Yeah, I um. That works. We will do it right at the end. All right, so the grits are definitely hot and ready to go for our dish. Um, you guys are pureeing your soup somewhere. Uh, we've, we're talking about now. We're talking about andouille sausage. Mm. So andouille sausage is a cold smoked pork sausage, and um, so this and so it's it's actually cooked. So you can eat it, well, I wouldn't, but you can eat it this way. I mean, it's perfectly fine right out of the refrigerator, but obviously we cook with it. That's its, that's its beauty. So we do a very small dice of both of these things in equal quantities um, because they're both equally good and equally good for the dish. Um, and that's, that's, that's an important part of shrimp grits. Now, the history of shrimp grit uh, is that um, people used to, uh, well, not used to, people go shrimping in Charleston it, 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 it's there's so much so many waterways uh, so many wonderful uh, seafood opportunities in that coastal area and in the inland waterways um, look at that that is beautiful I mean I, they're so sexy I mean that <laughs> yeah. that is sexy if you ask me <laughs> it's super silky I think I'll just take the pan and the spoon and go sit on your couch for like 20 minutes and, all right uh, there's a little difference between those and these can you see it yeah these aren't quite done that's a difference um, okay um, turn that soup off. So our soup is hot and ready to go. Grits are ready to go. Um, you guys are pureeing your soup. So how much time do we have? We've got 
got a couple minutes, so a couple questions okay. for you. Mm -hmm. One technique that some of our cooks at home should master. Oh, wow. Or, you know, what, if there's well, one that you were like. One of them is making a soup. Okay. So I've taught you basically how to make the foundation of a soup with the, and it doesn't have to have the leeks, but sauteing the onion. And since I added the shallot, uh, adding the cream, I could have added chicken stock. Um, I could make broccoli soup this way. I could make, um, I could make mushroom soup this way. I could, but with mushroom soup, I add bois madeira and a little bit of stock. Uh, with broccoli soup, I would probably finish it with a little bit of a uh, English cheddar um, when I puree it. Uh, but yeah, so you're learning how to make soup that's a cream-based soup. You could you can make crab soup this way, nice. which we all love. Yeah. Um, I like to put a Montiato sherry in my uh, crab soup or Manzanilla sherry in my crab soup, uh, which I add at the end of the cooking process with crab soup. Um, I add a little bit of mirepoix, so it would be finely chopped carrot, celery, onion, and uh, then you would add the cream. You would hopefully make a crab stock and um, add that, and then you'd have your picked crab meat. You would finish with a nice amount of cayenne pepper, a, a nice amount of nutmeg, and the manzanilla sherry. So you're, you're basically having a foundation here. The other thing is I would learn how to make eggs. Eggs are one of the least expensive products. And if you really learn, oh, I wish I could show you right now how to scramble an egg. Um, if you really scramble an egg where the pan is on low heat, low, low, low Why heat, super fresh Why egg. There, there's, 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 there's eggs in the refrigerator. All right, let's do it. Uh, I need a pan though. Hang on. I think I have a pan over here. All right. Let's see. How many okay. would you like? Two. Two eggs. Two eggs. Two eggs. All right, here we go. Over there. So the action of making an excellent scrambled egg is low heat, extremely fresh eggs, and um, season it properly and whisk it properly. So I get a bowl. Uh, how long should it take for the grits? That's somebody asked. Carolyn Gordon asked us. 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, where are the eggs? Oh, I put them in the bowl over there beside of the, uh, <laughs> the top, cooktop. Oh, oh, here. Okay. Oh. All right. Okay. So my pan is on. This is a perfect. This is a perfect pan for scrambled eggs. So okay. most people, you know, I know, you know, I get scared of using a non-Teflon pan because I'm afraid my eggs are going to stick. Right. And it's going to be ugly and right. they're not going to be what I want. It can happen. Um, the Heston pan will help you with that. A Teflon pan will help you with that. Or a hot pan with enough fat in it will help you with that. Thank you. All right. So a hot pan. You can see what's happening with the butter. Now I need to turn it down because I do not want that to brown. Um, I'm whisking my eggs. I'm whisking my eggs, and you need to whisk them well. You need enough fat to coat the entire bottom of that pan and up the sides. A little bit of salt. You want to crack some pepper in there for me? Sure. Thank you. Talk about on the fly. I love this. All right, and in that, that's good. And in that drawer is a spork. I need a fork. It should be right there in the front. All right, so now I'm on low heat. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm using a fork. My eggs are going in the fat. This and is selfish of me, just so you know, eggs are my favorite food. Me so. too. <laughs> me too. All right, there's a plate on that bottom drawer. Bottom you need drawer. to get yourself a fork. So I'm shaking the pan, and I'm moving my fork. And I, as you can see, I'm not even on the burner uh, at this point because this pan is so hot. I'm just going through your through your drawers now. <laughs> I'm just being nosy. Uh, the one over, over there has silverware on the top. Ah. Okay, so my eggs are cooking nicely. My pan has cooled down a little bit. I'm moving my fork. I'm breaking up the curd of the egg into the finest curd I can. I'm shaking my pan. I'm shaking my pan. I have heat. I'm on low heat. Uh, a French person would do this in a double boiler, which is a pot, a bowl over a pot with hot water in the bottom of it. And you do it in the bowl over the hot water, which really just is a softer cooking style so it doesn't heat the egg like directly or is... yeah you don't want it to cook too quickly i need the chance to break the curd up into very fine curd do you know what i mean when i say curd yes okay so i'm breaking see how fine parts. it is this looks nothing like <laughs> when a family member of yours used to make them for you when you were a child right correct right and my mother didn't make them like this either this is french this is not from the buffet at Shimmy's. <laughs> Didn't not say, a knock. I didn't say That's anything about that. Buffet, anyone? Not a knock. <laughs> Just saying. That's it. 
And so one of the things I like to do with this scrambled egg is make it with truff black winter truffles. Oh. Okay, that puts it over the top and that makes it expensive, but you tell me if those are any good. Oh, you, oh right, oh, right there. They're beautiful. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I'm gonna tell you how they taste here momentarily. All right. Okay, I'm gonna make the shrimp grits. I think it's time, yes? Oh my God. Oh, we're not gonna hear from him for a while. Mm. Okay, so your soup should be ready to go, pureed, strained, I'm sorry, not strained. Mm. You don't have to strain it. Pureed, ready to go. Um, your grits are ready to go. Your soup is hot and ready to be wow. eaten. So I'm going to go ahead and pour out. Well, I don't know how you guys are going to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and serve the soup so Andy can uh, taste it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's allergic. You have to watch out for these people that are allergic to a lot of things. Yeah, I have some allergies, uh -huh. so <laughs> Chef's taking care of me this evening. Yep. So I right. appreciate that. So he can't have shrimp grits, but he can have this soup. So, so uh, yes, go ahead. go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. All right, so with the soup, um, I'm going to whisk this a little bit. It's a little bit, has mm. some, this is not as smooth on top as I would like because we've been talking, which you may be doing too, hanging out. I'll take the blame for that. No, there's no blame, <laughs> but look how smooth it is now. That See, is it's beautiful. beautiful. So yeah. just by whisking it a little bit, and now we have this, oh God, I love this soup. This is one of my favorite soups. Um, so we have that beautiful soup. I'm going to put a little bit of my favorite extra virgin olive oil, which I didn't tell you about, um, as a garnish. Um, this is, um, it's from ancient foods as Keros, and it comes from the foothills of Mount, oh boy, Teguetos, which is, I don't, that's probably not right the way I said that. Um, woo, yes. Uh, I love how it sits on top. Um, and it's uh, just outside of Athens, Greece, and they're the oldest olive trees apparently in the world. Oh, wow. And I mean, that olive oil, oh my gosh. Oh, there's a spoon. Oh, perfect. I, my mise en place is out. I should have had confidence in myself. <laughs> all right, let's, I'm gonna put this in the refrigerator while okay. you, I can't handle having all this sit out of the refrigerator. It should be in it. Um, and you go ahead and taste the soup. Tell me how that is. And I'm gonna make shrimp grits here in a moment. Are you jealous right now? Cause I'm kind of jealous of myself. So. <laughs> yeah, cause we're gonna, we're gonna drink later. <laughs> So there. Oh my gosh. All right. That is divine. Good. Thank you. And that's a big word for me, just so you know. I like divine. Oh, that's divine. That is, is nice. Um, divine works. That is delicious. All right. So I'm making sure my grits are good. I don't know what I'm going to do with you, but so you can't have red meat either, right? I but, cannot have red meat. Okay, so you can't have grits. No. That's just all there is to it. Now, this pan yeah. is unbelievably hot. Okay. And I don't need that pan to be hot. So I'm going to take a moment um, and let that. How so is since, it? Since I do have a food allergy, I would like shellfish. Yeah. Is there something that you could substitute One for One of the things I love, uh, well, see, I'm going to miss the tasa on the andouille, but um, you can certainly do chicken. The, one of the other things I really like, the little saute, maybe with a little bit of curry and onion mm. and shallot and maybe even a touch of garlic. No, no garlic. Just a little curry, and then you could finish it. You could deglaze with white wine and add cream. Oh, my God. That would be so good. Um, or you could not do the cream and just, you know, saute, have a little bit of curry, uh, maybe a tiny bit of chicken stock, deglaze a pan, and, and get a little broth going finish with a little bit of butter, like we're going to do, actually. You can do that. Um, the other thing is the salmon and grits are so good together. So if you, can you have seafood? Yes. Yeah. So um, that's right. Um, so if you can, uh, you could, you could, I would pan roast the salmon. You could grill it, but I would pan roast it. And um, I like to cook high quality salmon to medium rare. Um, I love it that way. Yeah. And oh my gosh, salmon with grits. And again, maybe just a little, uh, you could do a little thyme oil or a little rosemary oil on there, or you could saute leeks and add it to it. What about your eggs? Oh, what do yeah. you think? What do you think of the eggs? They're unbelievable. I've never had eggs that just they melt. Tender. Just tender. Yeah, they're and they tender. Melt yeah. And just. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna make shrimp. Perfect. Um, I'm going into a pan that should be hot, but not super hot. You do not want this to the smoking point. Um, you don't want to uh, brown the. Sh I mean, you don't want to like. What do I want to say? Sear the outside of the shrimp. You want them to cook. I actually, at work, we do not even heat the pan. This is the one time we don't make the pan hot. So you can do it that way as well, where you're just going into a pan with corn oil. Corn oil is, has a high flash point, meaning that it burns at high heat. Butter uh, burns very quickly. It burns at low heat. So that's why we're not using butter at this point. You can see this amazing pan is just handling these, sh these shrimp beautifully. So I have six shrimp in here um, for an appetite. These are U12 shrimp. U12 shrimp mean under under 12 per pound. Okay. So obviously if it's like a 2630, 
that means there's between 26 and 30 shrimp per pound. So if I have U12, obviously they're big shrimp. Um, and you'll impress your butcher uh, or fishmonger if you say, I'd like U12 shrimp, please. <laughs> 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 All right. So these are, look at, look at that. Look at that. Look at, look at, look at. It's just, you know, mm, no sticking, just beautiful. All right. So the shrimp are working. And meanwhile, I have my tasso ham, andouille sausage, my chives. Uh, I have my white wine that I'm going to deglaze my pan with. And I've used so much butter in all of our fun today that I need to cut some more butter. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing is, is it's extremely critical uh, that your butter is cold. Uh, it has to be cold because if your butter is at room temperature, it will melt too fast and the sauce will break. Please, please make sure your butter is cold. Mm. If it's not, go get some new butter and like I'm doing right now and cut some butter. Um, you need it to be cold and in small squares. All right. You're fine. You're fine. Normally, I would never well, let anybody put their eat, food on my cutting board, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So I have a stick of very high quality butter here. This is a one time, too, uh, that it makes sense to use a high quality butter. This is Vermont Creamery, which is one of my favorite butters. Um, uh, Plugra or not Plugra. I take it back. Plugra is not as uh, Hopefully no one is working for Plugra. Um, it's not as good as it used to be. So any of the high fat butters, that's what you want for this dish. So the shrimp, once they're about halfway cooked, I turn them over. And I'm going to go back on high heat now. My, my heat is actually off at this point because I'm talking. And here we go. Look how beautiful that is. Those are cooked perfectly. They're not brown. They're just cooked perfectly. All right. So those I hope are all you at home are really appreciating this because... I know when I get to talking and I'm cooking that things get start to get out of hand. And she's doing a <laughs> whale of a job at making sure that these things are, are still beautiful and, and moving forward perfectly. Okay. okay, so what's happening now is now I'm adding the tasso ham and the andouille sausage. And you saw me put a tiny piece of butter in that pan. That's not part of the sauce. That's just allowing me to cook this meat. So tasso ham, andouille sausage. Um, that needs to work for a minute. The shrimp are almost done. And again, you should be ready with everything. Right now, you should be ready to eat. Uh, the, you know, either you're gonna pour the soup and eat it. Uh, honestly, you should have already eaten your soup because you're gonna need to eat this right away. Um, so eat your soup really fast. <laughs> Enjoy. And <clears throat> or if you're if there's some sort of a break or something that you're not able to. Uh, just wait to do this part. I mean, you're watching me do it, so you, you know you can do it yourself later. Um, this dish has to be eaten right away. All right, so it's ready to go. Um, I'm going to deglaze with a good quality white. This is La Vie Ferm, which I suggested to you. I'm deglazing the pan and I'm making the foundation of my sauce. So what you want is just enough butter, in, uh, sorry, you want enough white wine in there to cool that pan down a little bit, get the flavor, we call it the fond. It's what sticks to the bottom of the pan. You want just enough wine to get that off the bottom of the pan and to make the foundation of your sauce and to not allow the butter to break, but you don't want so much wine that it waters down your sauce. Uh, we're not making wine sauce, we're making butter sauce. And at the end, we had chives, fresh, finely chopped chives, which gives you a little onion product feeling. All right, you may put the grits in the bowl. So we can plate this for everybody. So is that oh, here, wait, here, here, a, here, here, here? Okay, one. all right, that's <laughs> right. I already one. gave you one. You gave me one. All right, we are ready to go. You've got to constantly. So, so where's that? Uh, here, right there. Oh. Um, so, look, oh my God. Okay, this is perfection. So uh, this sauce, see how thick it is? See how beautiful it is? Get it off the heat at this point and just let the rest of the butter melt in. You have to constantly swirl this pan the entire time. If you're not used to doing this sort of action, swirling a pan like this, you know, get a tong in there to do it, or I don't know, a spoon, but you've got to keep it moving. You cannot stop moving the pan because you're constantly incorporating butter into that white wine and that will keep it from breaking. So now I'm plating. All right. Should I go over here? Okay. Can you see it? All right. Here we go. Oop. Wrong way. Hmm. This looks so good. <laughs> I never get the, I've been making this dish for many, many years. Wow, you put way too many grits in here. Um, 
uh, oh, you yeah. left no room for my sauce. Uh. <laughs> it's okay though. Um, <laughs> I would not fill the dish up that much, but you get the idea. I would put about half that many grits in the bowl. Um, and yeah, that's shrimp and grits. Mm, I wish you could eat it. Well, maybe you can have a bite yeah. since, <laughs> since I cannot. All right. And I'm going to pull some of these flower petals oh, off. Nice. Oh, my God. I, I just love it. I love these flowers so much. And I have a couple of different colors I could alternate, but shrimp and grits. Cool. I think <laughs> I've got a couple of questions. I'm going to come over here and read really quickly. Um, how do you sharpen your knives? Okay. So I have a stone. I have a couple of different stones. And... Um, what you need to do is go on uh, where are my stones okay i don't know where they are um uh you can buy stones for your knives specifically made for your knives um so i have a lot of shun knives so i have shun stones um but you need to go online and watch a video of how to sharpen your knives because german knives are sharpened differently from asian knives and the different asian knives are sharpened differently from the other asian knives some of the asian knives only have one edge that is shocking. I mean, that's like, it's hard to believe, but that's how it is. So most knives have two edges, obviously, mm -hmm. a bevel that goes to this point. Um, but some of the Asian knives only have one. So you really need to know what knives you have um, and just go online and watch and practice. Um, but you need a couple of different uh, uh, weights of stone, um, basically how gritty they are. Uh, fine and pretty pretty not fine. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a whole world. I can't answer the question easily, but that's a general answer. But yeah, that, that's a beautiful thing about the internet. Just go on the internet, figure out what your company tells you to buy, buy that grade of stone, and then teach yourself. One of the things is a stone has to uh, sit in water for about 20 to 30 minutes, completely immersed in water, cold water, on the counter, you know, just sitting there um, so that it, it, it absorbs that water and then you can sharpen it. And you use water, you can either use water on your stone or honing oil on your stone. Uh, so, but once you do one, you ha you always have to do it that way. In other words, you can't use water and then go to oil and you can't use oil and then go to water. Well, you definitely can't use oil and go to water for sure. Uh, so uh, that's the other thing you need to know okay. about that. Good deal. Well, Chef, thank you so much. I know the parts that I could eat were absolutely <laughs> delicious. Thank you. And I hope everybody at home was as well. I will say there, uh, we do have, I'm going to toss it over to uh, Kathy Napier, and she has a little uh, a little announcement in honor of you. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Hi, Kathy. I have to unmute first. <laughs> Hello, Chef. Thank you so, so very much for an incredible demonstration history lesson, cooking lesson, techniques. Thank you so, so very much. Now, now, Chef, the Rotary Foundation recognizes a donation of $1,000 to the foundation with a Paul Harris Fellow in the name of Rotary's founder, Paul Harris. In honor of your generosity and participating as our celebrity chef this evening, Ron and I, are delighted to name you, Chef Wolf, as a Paul Harris Fellow. Your donation of your time and talents tonight is a true example of Rotary's motto, service above self. Andy, will you please present Chef with her certificate and Paul Harris pin? Thanks, Kathy. We're honored to have Chef Cindy as our newest Paul Harris Fellow, um, oh. which is uh, one of the biggest things that we can do in Rotary. As here's thank a you. certificate and thank a you. pen that I'm going to oh, place on your you. <laughs> on your chef's jacket. There, oh, I'm honored. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for helping us out today. My pleasure. That yeah. was fun. I hope you all enjoyed it. Good. Good. Learned good. Something. Thank you so much. Thank I think you. it's next up. Is it over to Tracy? I believe it is with a polio update. Tracy, Tracy Guido, hello. back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello and good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy Bledo. I'm the Polio Plus Chair for District 7570, and I'm a member of Bedford Rotary Club. 
And how great was that? I love Chef Wolf and how she presented it. She has quite the personality. And I think we need to make her a Rotarian. And yes, I am married also to a wonderful cook and he's in the kitchen making our meal. And I've got several ladies here from our area and we're going to enjoy that meal. He's also the one that created the dessert, the orange mousse, chocolate mousse that I hope some of you have made. Tonight is a world's greatest meal and boy is it ever, right? So please give at that website that is in your chat. Um, LaShonda who made our website is here tonight. So she, during this thing, put it up also on the 7570 Gives Back website while we were doing this. So you can find it in both places and it will be open until tomorrow morning. We've already raised over 1500 guys and my goal secretly was 2000, so help me get there, okay? Um, thank you, and please enjoy your meal. This is gonna help 400 million children get immunized in globally in, in Rotary, and it's through this meal tonight. So thank you all. Andy, on to you. All right. So thank you all. Thank you, Tracy, for that update on polio. We appreciate everybody tuning in today. I do have a question for Chef before we close out and we toss everybody into the breakout rooms. Chef, with all the wonderful things that you cook and, you know, you said you started, had the ability to taste beautiful things early in life, and I'm sure you continue to do that. What's your guilty pleasure? Like, is there like this thing, like, greasy cheeseburger from oh. famous drive through <laughs> uh, fast food restaurant that you're like, yeah, uh, that's kind of one of my, oh, you have to, you're going to make me admit. Oh, well, okay. I, I, this isn't greasy, but we have a place here called Andy Nelson's barbecue. And man, I, because I did live in North Carolina when I was little and mm -hmm. obviously got some seriously good barbecue down there. Uh, that's my favorite, but I don't think it's guilty pleasure. Okay. <laughs> that works. That works. That works. Well, thanks for that. We, again, we appreciate everybody being here. Again, the um, donation button is in the chat box. So feel free to throw a couple of bones in there before, uh, before you log off this evening. I'm gonna do that before I leave here. And uh, thank you, uh, District Governor Nancy for, for having us. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw you all to the breakout room. It's gonna be in there for 15 minutes so you guys can have some opportunity to network with some, some people you may or may not know. And feel free to chat it up for a little bit and uh, then break away and enjoy your dinner. Thank you all.